So let's go over to the main screen and start our deep dive, part two on Extrema Files. What player plays the Yellowstone National Park, you guys? So here we go. Let's we'll talk a little bit about it. It's going to be a multi part series chat. Let's go ahead. All right, back to the Extrema Files. Repivot! Oh, the movie ad. Ah. Uh, and this is, I will highlight, NMD's request for a deep dive. And again, we'll probably have, this will be a multi-part series as well that we'll chat about. So we see feces and ponds, amazing versatility, but willows and lava, negative temps. So Spectre, um, the tardigrades will also survive really cold temperatures, but <clears throat> there are bacteria that survive at really, really cold temperatures, like in particular in the Antarctic. They even survive the changes of um, like melting and refreezing that happen over the course of a day. So they're very, very adapt to it. So sharks don't live enough of a negative temp to be called an extremophile, but it's these little bacteria. Um, and there's also really um, like hot areas to like the thermo vents that you'll have. So that's not so much the, the tardigrades anymore, but we're going to go into some of those organisms that live there as well. The lava sharks. So I wasn't aware of the lava sharks. That's true. Liv things living at the ocean near the methane vents. Yep. And so Athena cat there, you've got a couple of factors working against. You have extreme pressure, and then you also have um, like the methane gases, so low levels of oxygen. I remember reading somewhere that microorganisms have been found super deep core drilling that they've done into the crust. Yeah, they are. Chris, they give us the likelihood and possibility of there being um, like life on other planets, which I think is really neat. There's snails that live near the thermal vents and have metal in their shells. Hugin, there's also some ants that incorporate metal into their um, exoskeleton to be more powerful. A little bit more introductory stuff on the extremophiles, and then we will... Um, probably call it a wrap and go into more examples next week like next saturday over um like what particular examples of extremophiles there are and what are some of the genetics behind the extremophiles because i think that'll be really cool yeah the salty friends golgonac will also jump a little bit into tardigrades because they're also um an extremophile as well because they can you know vacuum of space they can live in um there's also some extremophiles living in rocks. I'll also pull out the example of the insects that live in the Arctic Look or the Antarctic that have. Look at his little feet. They have feet seeds, but they're also just. Um, it's just really remarkable that they can live at such a cold temperature. They basically have antifreeze in their blood, which I think is really cool. They are Hugin. They are. And they will be part of our little deep dive into the foray of the extremophiles and talking about like you know what potential genetic -y changes they have um, that allows them to be the extremophiles that they are which i think is really neat and remember thermophiles were what that example of the um the, the polymerase which was in the pcr reaction so just so, just so you guys are aware of that remember we talked about it earlier Thermus aquaticus, thank you. Yes, Cliff. This is like the example of not just like the insects, but well, it's, it's similar to the insect style that you might find in the Arctic. I'm going to find some images and papers on the midges that we can find that can survive the extreme cold and freezing temperatures. Thank you, Thea. So this is our little teaser on tardigrades. I know you can look excited for this. All of, look at the, but seriously, but seriously, Golganak. But seriously, look at the feet. Look at. Look at, look, Athena cat, just look, right? Look at his little feetsies. Look at his little feetsies. Guys, I couldn't help but get so excited when there were feetsies. Like, guys, that was amazing. That was amazing. They are so cute. Does the dormant face have a name? It does, Spectre. I totally have spaced on it. We had the name last week when we were chatting about them. I need to double check and see what... Um, the last state that phase was and that is a teaser because that is one of the topics that we're going to be talking about next time is our knowledge of extremophiles how that is related to um, 
like potential space organisms. Tardigrades, let's see, were in the ton form, the dormant state where they shrivel into the ball. So it's, yeah, the ton form. There we go. Lower metabolism, cryptobiosis, and enters an environment better suited for sustained life. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I modded Butt's bot on that one, Alex, because I didn't want your comment to get lost. Hugin does not want to be Butt's botted anymore. <laughs> Butt's bot is like, all right, Hugin, stop. So, guys, I think that is going to be our stopping point for today. We've chatted about extremophiles, like a little bit of an intro, what they are, what they, where they can be located. We did a big derail into polymerase chain reaction, but that is fundamentally connected to extremophiles because one of the enzymes utilized in PCR is an extremophile. And then we kind of rounded back into defining some of the extremophiles that we're going to be chatting about in the next couple of weeks, including the tardigrade, as well as um, space and like potential life in space. Um, but yeah, extremophiles, high pressure, high temperature, high salinity. Um, yes, actually, Risto, if you want, we can kick off with Yellowstone and why that is has the location for extremophiles. Let me just quickly find... I pick out that right video first. So I don't know if any of y'all have actually seen this. I have not seen the location before. I've never been to Yellowstone, but I've seen images of this lake and it's absolutely beautiful. And it's as Risto said, the reason it has these weird rainbow-esque shimmering colors is because of the microorganisms living in the water, which is really, really cool, I think. <laughs> which I just, inherently, you guys, it's really, really cool. Just. I'm, you know, I'm not a geologist, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate these things. Isn't Yellowstone going to affect pretty much the planet? I've heard that as well, Thindal. Just given, like, how much ash can go up in the air. Uh, but it's, there's, there's been, again, I, my expert is not in geology expertise, but I have seen different modeling types of experiments to see, like, they have different suspicions of how it might affect everything. So it's tough to know. There doesn't seem to be a super consensus. There seems to be a leaning, but there's like ones on both sides of like how the models work and how things will change for it. Thermophiles are one of the terms of an extremophile. So extremophiles, like think of that as the umbrella term. And then as you narrow in further and further, you get more specific and then you start getting like thermophile, acidophile, and you know, it's thermophile heat, high heat that they can survive in. Yeah, so Risto, that's, as Risto points out, don't actually get in and swim in this. Now, I don't know offhand what the negative health consequences are immediately from this. I would imagine that the heat isn't ideal for your body, right? Because it was like 168 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That is a very bad thing. Um, but also, the bacteria certainly have some kind of a, would have some flavor of an effect on you. I don't know if anyone's actually looked at, like, from a mammalian perspective, what happens. Yeah, I mean, that's true, Golganak. Yes, but, like, as Bristo said, the sulfur, like, how much sulfur there is in there, too. So, it's not just the heat. And then, um, if there have been any studies, they found a foot in it. Bristo, it's actually quite remarkable that the foot survived. Um, yeah, I mean, Bristo, that is terrifying. But I also just imagine if you were able to isolate the bacteria... Maybe the bacteria on their own may have some kind of um, effect as well, like independent of the sulfur and the temperature. And I'm just, and Rista, I'm just saying that it's like from a, a curiosity perspective, right? Of like what those bacteria might have effect on like just cells. Like if you just put them on like human cells, I wonder what would happen or, you know, like feed it to a fruit fly or something like that. And one animal that once disappeared from the park has returned. The wolf. Hi, V. How you doing, V? Welcome in, V. I hope you're having a great day. Guys, go check out the legendary V. That's probably true, you guys. I'm sure Nightbot will catch up eventually. How are you doing today, V? You know how in the U.S. in many places there are those roadside side streets. Iceland has those too, but they are, but theirs are geysers and other geothermal waters. Oh, that's really cool, Alonzo. I did not know that. No, 
Um, that is really, really cool. V, how you doing? Yellowstone's Hayden Valley has turned into a prime habitat for some of North America's most powerful predators. It's early June, and the largest wolf pack in Yellowstone is on the hunt. Called the Wapiti Lake Pack, it's roughly 20 wolves strong. In 1995, wolves were reintroduced into the park. They quickly made a comeback. Today, there are roughly eight packs and 90 wolves inside the park. They have helped keep... I have no perception of how good that is in terms of, like, connecting, like, from... Like re like the from the rehabilitation perspective, um, but it's amazing that that's that exists. Um, I don't know, Race though. Maybe you have some idea of like what the previous numbers used to be, like how much of a good comeback it is. The fact that there's any kind of comeback is already a good sign. I don't know if they have some kind of threshold of how many wolves they think could survive well in that kind of given area. So that being thermophiles with tolerance for sulfur, that our body environment would be cold and uncomfortable for bacteria. See, Golganak, that's my curiosity, too. Like, um, we talked about this last week, that they were harvesting extremophiles from the Antarctic. And one issue was that they were trying to grow them in the same kind of media as regular cells, and they just kept dying. And so they need to grow them on that very, very specialized extreme frost, like ice temperatures to get them to do well. So, Golganak, your hypothesis might also be very accurate. It might be... I, like a bad thing like we're not what did they say like like yeah like a negative environment for those bacteria to be near in human cell culture but i'd just still be curious about it you know wolves are practically wiped out there was an overabundance of game to the point it was overpopulating oh oh i gotcha and so now risto they've reintroduced and so now they're taking out a lot of the deer wild game issue even opening up hunting yellowstone did didn't do anything they had to bring back in the wolves I mean, I, they're just, they're so beautiful animals, Risto, the wolves are, that it's just, I just look at them and I'm just like, oh my god, I just want to, I'm just very tempted to snuggle at all of them, you know? Like, I get that they're wild animals, but it's just like a, like an internal thing. I'm like, oh my god, it's a puppy. I'm sure, I'm sure y'all have that too, you understand. Elk populations in balance. And in a large pack, wolves can even take down yellow... Even, remember, Risto, though, we talked about, like, la losing um, things like mosquitoes and ticks um, because we don't like them. But then the wondering is, okay, if we do keep them, right, how they would, you know, like, if we get rid of them, how would they affect the biodiversity, right? And, like, the food chain. And so everything, it seems like, does have a purpose. Yeah, exactly, Risto. Hi, Moving Knowledge. How you doing, Moving Knowledge? It's good to see you. Yeah, who are wasps too? They do. Um, they have feeding behaviors that are critical for like maintaining populations. They also are like a cleaning creature that will like hollow out and like clean rotting wood. They have lots of purposes, and it's you know it's like oh they're really really frustrating. But then is it like you know what else happens? Ticks then all too are part of the food chain, like eating, being eat eating. Um, like as a diet for other organisms. So moving knowledge, we're talking about um, extremophiles. In the beginning of this video, I'll show you again once we finish. Um, but we were talking about this particular uh, spring called the Grand Pris Prismatic Spring. And it looks like a giant prism pattern on the lake itself. And what's really cool about that is it's actually different amounts of temperatures within the lake and there's different populations of microorganisms living throughout that lake and there are different kinds of thermophiles and that because we're keeping on our topic of extremophiles today possums yeah possums are great for ticks and actually who are possums ha are amazingly very cancer resistant who'd know right um see i've learned things from you all the time oh that's awesome risto that is that warms my heart more than you can imagine. It brings me so much joy to hear something like that because I feel like we all had love of science when we were younger. 
and then it's like you have those few classes that just crushes your like of it and then you know the popular kids will be like you're a nerd and blah 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 and so then you're not enjoying science anymore especially then if it's compounded by teachers who don't make it interesting and so but i feel like everyone has that initial love for it you know like discovery and curiosity and think learning how things work and that risto makes me extremely extremely happy yes wasp pollinate plums they also pollinate other things too smikes um one person's parasite another person's Nahash, i suppose i mean golganak that's that's kind of like our thinking with mosquitoes too right because mosquitoes also are pollinators but it's like you might not suspect that they are because it's like well the few that we we readily know are the ones that um drink our blood instead of the pollinators uh, but now all of a sudden there's ones that pollinate too and it's like oh that's really interesting so a lot of unique differences in the world a lot of flowers who who there's thousands of species of mosquitoes about i think 35 at last estimate are actually bloodsuckers and of those 10 are disease vectors with three being the primary ones that transmit disease um so really they're actually like a good thing like for like it's critical for the environment so that's always the interesting thing is like you know especially me when i was a kid you're like oh just kill all the mosquitoes but it turns out that they do have importance to them like what the rules of that for be but as a, you know i would totally also love to grab samples from this <laughs> Like, that's where my head goes right there. But you know what would be a great microscopy Monday? All of this here. Thanks for watching Science Media. And be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help our channel grow and support our science outreach and education goals. We can be found on Twitch most days of the week. And be sure to join us here for our next video. Thanks again, and stay curious, everyone.